All right. So we had um, three points of inquiry on the table for our discussion questions. Um, one being, what is the emphasis or the significance of this concept of ma'at? Um, how would you think about or articulate the notion of goodness in the ifa um, tradition? And then finally, what stood out to you most about the reading? Or what questions did you have about the reading? Uh, who would like to share? Um, I like how in one of their beliefs, it talks about that God created two humans in their womb. And it reminded me of Adam and Eve. But before Eve, it reminded me of Lilith, which mm -hmm. was the first wife of, of Adam. And Lilith didn't want to follow God's rules. So God sent her to hell. And so then, she, then he created Eve. And Eve was like the same thing with the apple. So when I read about, um, I can't pronounce the 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 man's name, Correct. but he also, yeah, um, he also talks about how he didn't want to follow God because he he felt alone. He wanted to be with the with his twin female, and God was like, "No, you have to wait." And so then he went his separate way, and God was like, "No, you betrayed me. I'm gonna punish you." So I made those connections yeah, those, in the reading. Those are some really good connections, Karen. Um, I would also, for, and for me, when I listened to you, one thing I was thinking about is how, at least in the Christian, um, from that interpretation of Christianity, right? Um, if you think about it, it kind of paints women in a bad light, right? I, I, don't, I don't know how else, else to articulate that, but um, the first wife, right? she was disobedient so god forced her to go to hell right um eve curiosity led her to bite the apple right so these women are the ones who are setting humanity back right and i think that's very interesting how um western religions kind of place women in, in these type of roles right and, and uh, yeah i just some that's that kind of rubs me the wrong way personally um, who else would like to share about what's discussed in their breakout room? Go ahead, Joanne. And I know, Marcus, you had your hand up too. Go ahead, Joanna. I'm sorry. I think one of the, the concepts of uh, the religion Ma'at that stood out the most to me was the one that says that we are all created in, um, in God's image. But unlike Christianity, you know, I feel that um, it, it leans more towards uh, the male because, you know, at the beginning, God created... When he spoke, he said, let's do men according to our image. But then it was not until later that he took um, uh, Eve out of his, ri out of his uh, ribs. So that's one something that stood out to me. And another thing is the, a lot of similarities of how you're supposed to live your daily life. For example, that there is an afterlife and um, that there's a judgment day, resurrection, you know, all similarities with the Christian religion, you know, but... I did notice some differences, but a lot of similarities, though. Yeah, absolutely, Joanna. Um, Lorraine? Oh, hey. Um, so I put the author's main arguments or points is that they want to let the reader know about the different types of religions among the Black community. The author also wants us to know that the religions are different due to the different distinctions among the Black tribe and that culture, nationality, race, heritage, and ethnicity all go with different types of religion depending on what culture you are. For example, on page 207, it says a glorious spirit in heaven, a continuing powerful presence on earth, justification in God's domain, resurrection after death. These are the rewards of the person without offense. And a righteous nation person is one who receives them. He will be counted among the ancestors. His name shall endure as a monument. And what he has done on earth will never perish or pass away. This was all written from the Mason religion. Yeah. That's what I put. Thank you, Lorian. Uh, very, very comprehensive. Um, one one uh -huh. thing, go ahead, I'm sorry. Somebody else wanna say something? Yes. Yes, go ahead, Baba Pierre, please, please do. Yes. Uh, it is, uh, 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 one of the basic tenets of mad is that God have created uh, men at its image. Mm -hmm. 
some theologists say that it's men that created God on its image. I, I think that this con conception can be believed because human beings don't know anything about God. And, and it is easier for him to imagine God with the, the qualities of the, the, the best of the, the humans. Yeah. And, and then also, Baba Pierre, something that you said would made me think, right? Um, this, I, this notion of God creating man is in his image. And then I heard you say that some theologians believe that um, man created God in their image, right? And so if we are to take the more um, predominant image of Jesus, right? The, the one that's in most churches, um, the one that's in most homes, right? Um, most religious institutions, that blonde haired, pale skinned, blue eyed Jesus that we all are familiar with, right? Literally is the cousin of Michelangelo who painted one of the original images of Christ, right? Or of the one that they call Christ. So to me, when I hear Baba Pierre say like this is contested notion that um, some believe that God's image was created in the image of man, right? To me, that kind of speaks to this fact of um, when Constantine and begins this, what they call the crusades, right? And where Christianity begins to be uh, proliferated throughout the world to conquer, right? Part of that creed was to change the image of God and to change the image of God to look like those who would be doing the conquering, right? And hence why he asked Michelangelo to paint a picture of the so-called Christ to also begin to change the image of how people see God. Because what's, what's interesting is if you go into a lot of the Catholic churches, um, like in Europe, right? The old Catholic churches, they'll have very black, and I don't mean like brown skin like my skin, I mean black like my sweater, right? images of the Madonna and the baby Jesus. And you see the pictures of the Pope praying and worshiping these figures in these, in these images. So it was a very concerted effort to change the image of God from how um, he was viewed or how she was viewed even, right? Prior to modernity, prior to European invasion and conquest to what we are more comfortable with now. So, so thank you, Baba Pierre, you bring up some very um, good points. Um, okay. All right, bro, hold on. I got my um, teacher's aid with me, so if, I, if you see me looking away from the screen, I'm just looking at my son, so bear with me. Okay, uh, I'm going to jump into my notes on the reading. Um, so we're, we're cracking open this idea of uh, Black religion, of uh, Black spirituality, um, what, I, what I would say African spirituality, because if you get back to the root of it, right, he, he has to trace those origins back to Africa. Um, Excuse me. He does provide us with a, um, a working definition as this chapter, right? As the chapter itself will define religion. He says as um, the thought, belief, practice concerned with the transcendent and the um, ultimate questions of life, right? So this is how he defines this, this notion of religion. Um, but, but to, I believe, Laura Ann's point, right? He says that this idea that the way that Black folks practice Christianity is an adoption of westernized Christianity, Christianity, excuse me, is a misnomer, right? Because he says each people practice, actuate, and perform religion and spirituality based off of their cultural specificity, right? In other words, he says that the essence of a people's religion is rooted in its own social and historical experiences and in the truth and meaning they extract from these and translate into an alternative, um, sorry, translate into an authentic experience, right? So people's historical, cultural experience are gonna determine how they relate to these religions, right? And, and I think what you have, 
So if you are to look at spirituality in places like Brazil, um, places like Cuba, um, it's mentioned in the text as like the contemplé, right? So these are um, African spiritual traditions that when the enslaved people of Africa were brought to the Caribbean, right? And they were forced to practice these European religions, um, particularly Catholicism, they found ways to um, sneak in their indigenous African traditional practices within this religion of, that you call um, Catholicism, right? So for example, Catholicism has all the saints. And I'm not too familiar with Catholic Catholicism, so forgive me if I you know, mess that up. But you know, you have, I think St. Paul is a saint, Peter's a saint, right? So what the um, Africans would do is they would assign what are called Orishas, right? Or intermediaries between the Supreme God and humans, right? Um, so for example, um, Eshu is an Orisha, right? And so what they would do is say, we'll assign a shoe to the, the, the St. Paul, right? So when we're praying to Paul, we're really honoring a shoe. So they found ways to subvert their indigenous African practices into these um, Europeanized religions. And this is an example of what Karanga is talking about, how they're going to bring in their own historical context and their own cultural specificities and interlock them into how they practice these religions, okay? Um, and, and, and again, kind of going back to Laura Ann's point, right? So Karanga is very attentive to there's a wide diversity of African people, right? There's a wide diversity of African culture. But what he's trying to look at is what are the um, universalities? What are the sameness? What is the homogeneity within these cultures as it pertains to how they practice religion, right? So he said there's some general things that appear in all African spiritual, spiritual traditions. Um, one is the belief in one supreme God. Two is God is both imminent and trans, uh, transcendent, so he could, or he or she could be near or far, right? Um, and, and th three is the ancestor veneration, right? So the honoring of your ancestors. And then he kind of breaks down why ancestral veneration becomes important. Um, the first reason being is a source and symbol of your lineage. Um, second being, is there's models of ethical life, service, and social achievement to the community. The third one being um, spiritual intercessors between the humans and the creators. And for me, um, that third one becomes really important, right? Because oftentimes how this is understood, the roles of the ancestors is, they may be able to carry that message that you have in this, this human realm, right? to the creator, to the most high, to God, right? So they're the, the, the translators, if you will, between the, the desires of the, the, the people here on, the, on earth and the um, being able to carry those desires to God, right? So this is the roles that the ancestors serve. Um, the fourth one being um, balance between one's collective identity and responsibility as a member of a society and one's own personal identity and responsibility okay so these are the that's the work and, and the rationale behind um ancestral veneration um okay okay and then so I'm, I'm, we're gonna move into my op now right um he gave a, a a working broad definition of my op, um righteousness in the spiritual and moral sense in three realms um with the divine the natural and the social, right? So within these realms, the divine, the natural, and the social, there should be rightness and a spiritual and moral sense of, in a, in a, um, in a spiritual and moral sense, right? So when you think about the first realm, they call it the divine, right? So you should be right and moral in your spiritual practice, right? Okay. The second sense um, or the second realm is the natural, right? You should be righteous and moral in the way that you interact with nature, with the natur, right? With, with, with the, the, your environment around you. So not the idea of conquering nature and overcoming and overpowering and dominating nature, it's coexisting with nature and honoring nature and learning from nature, right? And then the, the final realm is the social, how we interact with one another as a society. We should be righteous and moral in, that, in, in those interactions. Um, the seven carnal virtues, truth, justice, propriety, harmony, balance, reciprocity, and order. Um, 
also, I believe it was Joanna was saying how she appreciated how um, Ma'at has like a, a feminine characteristic to it. If I could put words into your mouth, I know you didn't say that exactly, but that's kind of what I've extracted from what, what you were saying, right? And, and I think she's spot on about that. Give me one second. I, don't know, I want to pull up an image of Ma'at for you all. Uh, you're not, you're cool if you need I'm, nothing. We're doing good. Uh, I was going to ask you for your book in a little bit, okay? Actually, no, let me see the book. Let me see the book. Uh, what did you get? They got my eye on it, yep. Yeah. That's, that's not a good one. I want to get a better one. So these are some images of my eye, and I'll point out two. Um, we'll look at this one. Um, so if you notice, make it smaller. Um, you can see the feather on top of her head, correct? So here's the significance of that feather. When you would transition into the afterlife, right, or, or and you had to state what they call the 42 Confessions of Ma'at. Um, and, and this may sound very similar to the Ten Commandments, but the 42 Confessions of Ma'at would sound like this. Um, I, sh I have not committed adultery. I have not murdered. I have not coveted my neighbor's wife, right? And as you state these confessions, your heart is placed on a scale. So it's your heart on the scale and then the feather that's on top of Ma'at's head is placed on the scale. So as you state these confessions, you must state them with truth. You must state them with a pure heart and a clean soul. And if you're able to do that, then your heart will be lighter than the feather, right? But if you cannot state these confessions from a space of truth, from a space of honor, from a space of justice, right? Then your heart will, be, will not be lighter than the feather and you will not be able to successfully um, navigate to the afterlife. I want to show you one more image. Yeah, if you want, break, you go outside too. Huh? If you want, you go outside. You don't have to stay in here. Okay. You okay? So here's the image um, that I was referring to of the judgment scene. Shit. So if you look closely, right? Um, you can see the Anbis. That's, that's uh, Haru. Okay, so you can see um, the, the scale here, right? And then you see a heart and the feathers like tells it on the scale. Um, this individual is stating the 42 confessions, right? And um, if in fact their heart is lighter than the feather, then they're able to make it to the successful afterlife or what you may consider heaven, right? Um, in the event that it's not as light of a feather, um, then the en Anbis, um, this figure here with the jackal head, um, will take your soul to um, the lower realm of the afterlife or what you may consider hell, right? So not only is she a feminine goddess, right? Um, but she's also the moral compass for the society as a whole, right? So when you do things, you want to do things in alignment with Ma'a. Um, a lot of what Moranga, Karanga, excuse me, is pulling this information from about Ma'a is from this book here, um, Ma'a, the ancient idea, the moral ideal in ancient Egypt, which is written by um, Karanga himself as well. So, um, and that's another thing to think about, right? If you read closely, you can see that Karanga is using previous books that he wrote to make this book, right? And this is another practice for you as an intellectual and as a scholar. Why make work harder on yourself, right? If you wrote an article that is fit to another article that you're working on, take little aspects of that article and put it into the new article, right? Like don't write the same shit over again. Why, why do double work? So don't be afraid to cite yourself, right? Okay. Um, then he gives us this idea, this concept of husia, right? And he says that it's a, um, it's a, it's a text, right? And it's a, um, so 
one, if we are to put, break down the etymology of Husia, right? Hu is an authoritative utterance, right? So a speech that's made with great authority, right? Um, I'm trying, I was, I was going to say like, a, 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 if a king was to give a speech, right, that's going to be given with great authority. I know in our, in our society, like we don't look at the president most of us don't. I don't know about some of y'all, but I don't look at the the president with that authority. That doesn't have that that powerful utterance to me. Um, but it also says right. So who is uh, the authoritative utterance? And um, Sia is of exceptional sight, right? So this is what this term who Sia breaks down to, right? And because I have exceptional sight, because I have seen these things, I can make this utterance with an authoritative presence. Right, so this is this notion of Husia. Um, and, and this notion of Husia introduces the fundamental principle that humans are in the image of God and they have a moral and sacred status and must never be treated in any other way that, that violates their dignity. And I think this is profoundly, profoundly, profoundly important, right? Because if we're made in the image of God, right? And if you are to take all the divinity that's in within God and all the reverence that we place on God and all the honor that we give to God, right? And we are created in her likeness, then elements of that are within us, right? And we should do nothing that would dishonor the God in us, right? So nothing that I should do should dishonor the God that's in Zaria, right? Nothing that I should do should dishonor the God that's in Daniel. Right. Nothing that I should do should dishonor the God that's in Marcus and Laura Ann and Joanna and unique. Right. We should not do things that disfoul or dishonor the God within us. We should not do things to ourselves. Right. That will defoul or dishonor the God within us. So if a society is built on that type of understanding. Historical phenomena like enslavement would be impossible. Right. Because I couldn't treat someone less than a human being because they're a God, right? There's God in them. And this is why this idea and this concept is so profoundly important. Um, and then, you know, then we, we will move into Ifa and I'll close it out. But it says that Odu Ifa, the central message um, revolves around the teachings of the goodness of and in the world, right? So it's just innate belief that the world is a good place that people in the world are good, right? But, you know, it, it's important to note, however, that although the world is essentially good, there's a constant need to struggle to increase the good in the world, right? And, and, and to replenish the good that may be lost. So we're not gonna just say that, oh, because essentially the world is good, we're not gonna move on trying to make the world a better place. We're going to continue to keep this good essence of the world intact. So we must continue to work, struggle, organize, and do what we must do to keep this goodness in place, right? Um, and then also within this Aoife concept is the idea of the chosen status of humans, right? So, but, but not to get confused that there's certain humans that have more of a cho chosen status than others, right? All humans are chosen. And all humans must be honored as such, right? And it says it's not a chosen based chosenness based on preference for one people over all others, rather a chosenness based on the assignment and the power to complete it given to all people, right? So we have a power that's given to us. That power that's allow us to make the world a better place, right? And you must reverence that power in other people because of their capacity to make the world a better place, right? There's some things that I may be tasked to do to make the world a better place that I am not able to do, but Brian can do it, right? So I must honor Brian and Brian's abilities to help make this world a better place. So we're in this together as, a, as humanity, as according to the Aoife tradition, right? To increase the goodness on this planet. And to me, um, this is vastly different from how religion has been interpreted in our modern world, right? Um, a religion has become very fragmented. And if you ain't Muslim, then I ain't fucking with you. 
If you ain't Christian, then I can't fuck with you. If you ain't Buddhist, and I'm Buddhist, I can't fuck with you, right? But they're talking about the goodness in all people. Regardless if you practice Ifa or not, there's a goodness in you, and I'm going to honor that goodness in you. And it, and, and it makes me question the notion of progress, right? Because we are supposed to be the most advanced society. This, this stuff was considered ancient, right? Prehistoric, primitive, right? This is how they talk about these, these thoughts and these spiritual practices, right? But to me, if we were practicing these things today, we would not be in the decrepit state that we're in. You can't have global warming if you honor the planet, right? Because it's out of pocket to fuck the planet up. You're dishonoring God by dishonoring her creations, right? So again, it just makes me question this idea of us being an advanced society, you know? Because um, to me, it's primitive to destroy your home. Think about this. <laughs> think about how they talk about the riots. Y'all can think back two, two years ago in the summertime um, when black folks and white folks and everybody low key was tearing these cities up because these police was acting crazy, right? And the commentary would be, why would you destroy your own home? Look at these savage people. Look what they're doing to their own neighborhoods, right? But lo and behold, the powers that be are fucking up the planet. That's our home, right? So how can you apply that logic to one group of people, but not another, right? And no matter, and, and no matter what you do, right? No matter where you live, California, New York, or wherever, right? We're all on this planet Earth. We all on that. So once you mess up the, with the Earth, well, then what you gonna, gonna do, right? But they, they're plotting to just try to get their way to outer space. They're gonna fuck that up too. Um, but anyway, those are my notes. We'll transition into my to our fishbowl. Um, remember, you could talk about the notes, you could talk about the breakout room conversations, or you could talk about your journals. Um, one second. Uh-huh. See bat. Yes. Mm hmm That's good, bro. Okay. Does anybody want to volunteer for fishbowl? You only have to go twice a semester. Yes, I have a Okay. So we'll have Baba Pierre. Um I, I see Laura Ann, your hand is up as well. We could get one more. Uh, if not, I'll just call on somebody at random. Marcus? Okay. Thank you, Marcus. So we'll have Marcus, Laura Ann, and Baba Pierre for our fishbowl today. Uh, whoever wants to start it off, it's on you. Uh, I'll start off. Okay. So I put, um, for contemporary analysis, how does the reading relate to what's going on in the world today? I put the reading relates to what's going on in the world today because there is still a lot of uncertainty amongst different people and different religions. In other words, there is a big misunderstanding amongst many people that causes tension and needs to have some good communication and understanding. This book does a, good, does a great job of clarifying those things. It also wants to let everyone know that they are important and everyone's opinion matters if we are respectful towards one another. In other words, don't criticize and belittle anyone's beliefs or faith. Everyone has a right to believe in what they choose to believe in. On pages 209 to 210, it says the goodness of the world. The Isla tradition uh, asserts that at the time of creation, Allah Dumar, God sent Orisha, divine spirits into the world to make the world good and he gave them the the ace power or agency to complete their work and do it well the word used here for making the the world good is dara which not only means good in the sense of beneficial and suitable to a purpose but also pleasant and enjoyable i thought this was a beautiful thing written in the book absolutely thank you Lauren. um marcus or baba pierre Yes, sir. Considering the declaration of 
innocence, we can say that the deceased appears before the, 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 the divine tribunal to affirm that he led a Marcian life respecting the 42 tenets of might and to claim his right to eternal bliss. We can compare this 42 tenets to the 10 commandments that God communicated to Moses in the Old Testament. Among the 10 commandments, almost the half concern the obligations of men toward gods. While of the 42 declarations, only four concern gods, all the rest related to the behavior that man must have with his, his fellow men and with animals and nature. That is to say that the Martian tenets have a greatest preoccupation for the happiness of human beings than the 10 comments of the Bible. I, I hope y'all caught that, man. Like, like, I'm be here dropping bars, man. I hope y'all really get the depth of what he'd be saying. And I'm gonna provide some contextualization to what he's saying, but I'm, I'm gonna let Marcus go, go next. But all right, so I'm go ahead. I'm listening. Oh, okay. Um, so when when I was taking notes about when you were talking about religion and God believe and transcend it, um, does it does God want us to like you know uh, stay like protected and stay like um, religious in our country or in our state that we're in? So uh, I'm going to rephrase your question to make sure I understood it. You're saying like you were thinking about in my notes how it's saying God is transcendent and imminent, right? So he could be far or, or, or away. Yes. Thank you, son. You know. And you said that, um, so does that, because that mean that he wants us to be protected in our, in our central location, correct? That's what you were asking me, Marcus? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with that. And also that God has the power also to protect all right so not only just our centralized state in california but the universe as a whole right so that's why he could be transmitting and and imminent like he could be close and far away um so i would argue that yes god would want us to be protected you know at both of those capacities okay cool. um what i want to do is kind of go back to baba pierre and, and what his words were talk, what his words were mentioning, made me think about the distinctions between the Ten Commandments and the de declarations, right? And, and I, I want to kind of situate ourselves there for a moment. What is the difference between a commandment and a declaration? What's the difference? Uh, so. A commandment is when you want to do something or just do it anyway right. and not like not like just telling them to do it you just do it on your own and you don't have to like ask for any of like um permission yeah 
like information or questions about about it and then declaration is like you you do want to you do want to like learn it or know it but you're just like literally just like um wanted to um get used to it or just, just okay um anybody want to help add to that um distinction between commandments and declarations go ahead joanna well i think a commandment is is um it's more like telling you that you have to do that you know that you have no other choice other than a declaration is like, i believe that you have the option whether to do it or not to do it okay so let's think about this from a temporal standpoint right from a time standpoint so when you hear temporal just think time um and i quick teaching moment like I do the, I drop these words in here. So that way, if you go on to higher education and you hear those words, like, yo, I heard that before. Right. So this is why I, I use these words very strategically for your benefit. But anyway, from, from a temporal standpoint, right. If you're thinking about time, what's the difference from a time standpoint between um, how these declarations are being submitted and stated, right. And how the commandments are stated. So think about it this way. You state your declarations, right? Once you die or you're on your way of transitioning into the afterlife, right? Okay. Um, the commandments, have we talked about the, the acronym for the Bible? Have you talked about that in this class? Okay. Does anyone know what the acronym for the Bible is? B-I-B-L-E, the acronym. Um, basic instructions before leaving earth is what the acronym for the Bible is. Basic instructions before leaving earth, right? So, and when we're thinking about this temporally, okay? So these commandments are telling you what to do while you're living, right? Thou shall not kill. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not destroy, right? Telling you what to do, right? I'm going to read for you the declarations of innocence. Again, coming from this text here by Karanga. I have not done isef. I have not stolen. I have not been covetous. I have not robbed. I have not killed people. I have not reduced the requirements of the temple. I have not done fraudulent thing. I have not stolen the property of God. I have not told lies. I have not taken away food. I have not been ill-tempered. I have not transgressed. I have not killed sacred cattle. I have not extorted. I have not stolen bread rations. I have not eavesdropped. I have not been talkative. I have not contended except concerning my own property. I have not committed adultery. I have not been um, committed fornication. I have not caused fear. I have not misled. I have not been hot tempered. I have not been deaf to words of truth. I have not caused strife. I have not winked at injustice. I have not practiced illicit sex. I have not been false. I have not been quarreled with another. I have not been aggressive. I have not been impatient. I have not misrepresented my nature. I have not gossiped about matters. I have not done evil. I have not reviled the king. I have not waited in water. I have not been loud of voice. I have not blasphemed God. I have not been immodest. I have not made distinctions of others from myself. <laughs> I have not had needs greater than my own property. I have not reviled the dignity of divinity, excuse me, of my city. All right. So those are the 42 confessions or declarations of innocence. That sounds vastly different between that. I have not and thou shall not. Right. Again, thinking about time, what's the difference? What's the difference? Go ahead, Zara. Say it out loud. You're right. One is for after, the other one is before. Bingo. B 
thing. You, got, you guys get that? So if the commandments are telling you before you die, don't do this shit, right? You, you better not do this or else you're going to hell, right? I'm commanding you. But these declarations is what I have done or what I have not done, right? This is how I live my life. And I'm stating to you how my life was lived. Uh, Brianna? What's weighted in water? Um, I, I don't know what that means um, in this context, but like, it makes me think about like the, the, the what they call the Negro spirituals where they tell you to wait in the water. Um, and, and the spiritual goes, cause God's gonna trouble the water, right? And it's like, destruction's gonna come, but chill out in this water to be safe. I don't know how this applies to, to the, the, the confessions, to, just to be honest with you. Um, what I will do is I'll hop on the online and see if I could kind of find some information that, that would answer your question more directly. But to be honest, I can't give you an accurate uh, assessment, assessment of what that would mean. But very good question, though. Um, so these are the distinctions between right a commandment and a declaration. And, and I have to agree with Baba Pierre that this leads to a more just life, right? Because you could go all you want and tell people what to do and how to do it, but having them have a self-ownership and how and the way that they live their life is going to be more generative, right? Um, just for me thinking about, about my upbringing, right? My parents told me what not to do all the time, right? And I kind of found my way around that shit, right? I, I kind of found the ways to do what I wanted to do, right? But I think it would be a lot different if it was like, mm, you can do what you want to do, homie, but this are going to be, here's some of the consequences, right? And, and I think this is more of the um, approach that Ma'at has, right? I'll read one more um, from another book and we'll open it up to a, a broader discussion probably. Um, so this is the teachings of Patahotep, the oldest book in the world, okay? Um, so I, I just want to, it's really short, but again, think about this. It's the oldest book in the world, right? Um, the same type of individuals who produced Ma'at are the ones who are producing this book here, right? And... The author of this book, Patahotep, is 110 years old when he writes the book. 110. He asked to the pharaoh of the time, which is King Asa, um, he says, may your servant be authorized to use the status that old age affords, he's 110 years, right, um, to teach the hearers so as to tell them the words of those who have listened to the ways of our ancestors and of those who have listened to the gods. May I do this for you so that strife may be banned from among our people and so that the two shores may serve you. Let me ask you, what does strife mean? What does it mean to have strife? Hmm? What is strife? Problems? Yes. Conflict? Yes, both, both. Problems and conflict, right? Beef, right? So I'm gonna read this one more again and think about this term strife. May your servant be authorized to use the status that old age affords to teach the hearers so as to tell them the words of those who have listened to the ways of our ancestors. And so, sorry, and of those who have listened to the gods, may I do this for you so that strife may be banned from among our people and so that the two shores may serve you. So we're going to break this down, right? So one, I want to use my 110 years of wisdom to write this book, right? And I want to um, teach the people who are willing to listen, the hearers, and tell them the words of those who listen to our ancestors, right? So in other words, in my 110 years on this planet, I've been listening to those who listen to the ancestors, right? 
And I want to take what I've listened to for my 110 years and tell it to the people who are willing to listen to me, right? Um, also, and of those who have listened to the gods, right? So not only for those people who have listened to the ancestors, those are, that's what I'm hearing, but I'm also hearing the people who have listened to the gods, right? And I want to do this for you, King, so that strife may be banned from among our people. Right? So that our people ain't beefing with each other. So there's no problems and no quarrels, right, within this society, right? And so that the two shores, so think of, if we're thinking about the United States, right, we have the West Coast, we have the East Coast, right? The shore of the East Coast is the Atlantic Ocean, right? The shore of the West Coast is the Pacific Ocean. So that these two shores, the whole nation will serve you. Right. So there's no beef between East and West. There's no beef between North and South. Everyone is in harmony serving the one king. Right. Then he continues. And so begins the formulation of Metter Nefer, which translates to good speech. To be spoken by the prince, the count, God's beloved, the eldest son of the Pharaoh, the son of his body, the mayor of the city and visor, Patahotep instructs the ignorant in the knowledge and in the standards of good speech. It will profit those who hear, it will be a loss to those who transgress. Patahotep began to speak to the Pharaoh's son. So how Patahotep wants to eliminate strife from his society is through the metronifer, it's through good speech. Right. So this is how I'm going to create this harmonious, what we may think of utopian society by altering the way that we speak to one another. Right. And then in the, in the subsequent pages, he goes on um, delivering us 40, what is it, 42? One second, son, we're almost done. Uh, 30, 37 proverbs, if you will right? And, and just shows you how to live a harmonious life, right? So if you kind of take these kind of concepts, right, hyper-focus on how we speak to one another, right? Hyper-focus hyper on living a life that's truth, that's justice, that's harmonious, that's balanced, that's in an order, that's prosperous, that's reciprocal, right? Prioritizing a life that sees the goodness not only in all people, but in the world itself, right? These are the things that these people who were studying and researching that we call Africans, right? This is what was important to them. This is what meant something to them. This is what they cared about, right? This is why when foreigners came in and seen all the gold, all the diamonds, all the oil, and all these resources that could be used for accumulation of wealth. And they saw that these African people weren't using them as such, right? Because they didn't value that. Their value wasn't accumulating wealth and conquering, right? They were concerned about having good speech with one another. They were concerned with seeing the good in the world and in other people. Right. Which makes sense as to why when the war kicks off and they begin to conquer, the African people aren't prepared to fight. Because we're seeing the good in people. I don't believe that allowing you into my trade route will cause you to forever take over this port. Right. It's where I will never get my land back because I don't see you as an evil person. I, I'm trusting the good in you. Right. So it just becomes interesting how they're able to take this um, good naturedness in African people and, and, and articulate it as weakness, right? Curious to hear your thoughts, comments, and concerns. So what do you think about uh, God? Or about, Christian, or referring to Christianity in in a sense, is it's complicated. Um, 
I, I was actually I was asked this yesterday at my Cal State LA class. Um, and the question was asked is how do you reconcile the contradictions of Christian history, right? And, and black folks um, hyper visibility in Christianity. And for me, the way that I answered this question, I think I, I think it will be cool, fruitful for your question also. Um, I'm gonna throw out some names for you. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King, Ben Mark Vesey, Nat Turner, Gabriel Prosser, right? These are all um, black men um, who were preachers and they preached Christianity, right? But mm. the type of Christianity that they preach wasn't about being subservient to your master and, and getting freedom in the afterlife, right? Nat Turner, uh, anyway, Nat Turner said God gave him a message, right? God came to him in a dream and told him to cut these slave masters' heads off, right? <laughs> God told him, right? Gabriel, yeah. um, Gabriel Presser and Denmark Vinci, the same thing, right? God inspired them to take vengeance and free my people, right? So that kind of Christianity, I can fuck with that. I, I'm, I'm all for that, right? But, but the kind that says, you know, turn the other cheek to get your, your face broke and all that, I, I don't have time for that, you know? Um, and, and, I, and honestly, I don't believe that is in tune with what I was just talking about far as seeing the good in people, seeing the good, right? You got to honor yourself and, and, and allowing the God in yourself to be defiled to me is out of principle with the ancient African tradition. Okay. If that answers your question, Joanne. Yeah, yeah. Because I, you know, while, while studying the reading, like I said, I know that I noticed a lot of similarities and a lot of the, the things that you're talking about, like, for example, you know, be kind to one another, like the way we speak to one another. Uh, that's in the, you know, I find that that's in the Bible too. So what do you, what do you, what is your, what do you think about the Bible in that way? Well, um, I put a name in the chat. I, I would suggest you all to look this brother up, um, type, just go on YouTube and see um, what he's talking about. But I'll use him as a source to answer your question. Really, um, the Bible that we know it is essentially um, the European interpretation of what is on the walls of the hieroglyphics or what we may call the Netra Heru, or the Netra Netra, excuse me, um, the ancient comedic language, right? So these Europeans go into these temples and they see these magnificent, magnificent, excuse me, um, paintings, murals, um, sketches into the wall, and they get their um, brightest translators, right? And they try to interpret what's written there and they come up with the Bible, right? So obviously they don't have the full interpretation of what's been written on those walls. So there's gonna be things that are missed, but through the, their, it, because of the interpretation, we find these similarities, right? Mm -hmm. So one way to think about it is that the Bible is a poorly interpreted manuscript of ancient comedic theology, mm -hmm. right? And the brother I put in the chat, Ashwa Kwesi, he has a book called the African origins of Christianity. And all that book talks about in great detail what I just described, right? Um, so that's how I would answer the question. So, you know, it's one of those things that you don't want to necessarily throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Because there is some good there. Um, but understand too, this is an interpretation of a deeper sacred truth. Okay, all right. Yeah, because I was, um, oh, I I'm, I still am, I still consider myself a, a Christian. Mm -hmm. And like you said that while growing up, my parents were, uh, were very strict on the do not do this, do not do this. And yeah. as a result, I noticed that the more they did that to me, the more I did it, you know? So, yeah. mm -hmm. but I, I did find my way around, you know, and I feel that it's very important to have that communication. But at the end of the day, I feel that it's something very, very personal. Yeah. that no one else can influence but you have to find that on your own yeah so. i and, and i think um I, I agree with you wholeheartedly i also as i mentioned you know i grew up in a really strict christian household like really strict um and then i, I, don't, I don't know about y'all but like for a black christian household so sunday you in church from like fucking nine till two yeah. and you might eat and then go back to the evening service so you in there from five to nine p.m right so like your whole damn day is in yeah. church um so so I, I i completely agree but i just you know it's not everything ain't black and white you know what i mean and, and the way that the bible 
is interpreted and talked about is very black and white. You know what I mean? And it is, it is, the world is gray in all kinds of colors, you know? Um, and I don't think um, that strictness allows for that, um, that nuance and that complexity of thought. Um, other questions? Gabriel, what's your thoughts on today's discussion or the reading? Yes, oh, I have a question. Oh. Yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> it was said at the beginning of the course that we are working in a comparative perspective. Yes. I, I don't know why up to now, there is no uh, allusion to the, to the other religions, to the other ancient civilization, like uh, that of Mesopotamia. Yeah, man, you, uh, man, I swear, Bobby, you might want to teach this class, bro. Um, so what he's asking is like, if this is a comparative class, right? Um, and when we're talking about these ancient religions, there's other civilizations like the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia, where are their religious um, presence in, in, in this conversation? Um, and to dispel any thoughts that, oh, we're in a black studies class, why would we talk about Mesopotamia? That's not necessarily the truth. Um, So this book, they came before Columbus, right? The um, African presence in the ancient Americas. Um, talks oh, yeah. About, yeah, it's a really good book. It talks about there is an African origin, original presence in, in these areas of Mesopotamia, right? Um, and it talks about how a lot of the um, religious practices that you find in West Africa um, are also present in a lot of these ancient Mesopotamian um, religious societies. Um, so for example, just real quick, and there's a certain religion, I forget the name, in West Africa who kind of believe, not believe, but they, they honor and venerate um, the hyena as one of the um, deities to kind of pay attention to, right? And the same exact practices from this West African um, religion are found in um, central Mexico, but instead of it being hyena, it's a coyote, right? Because obviously there's no hyenas in Mexico, but there are coyotes. So they found the next best thing. So I, I, I agree with you, Baba Pierre. I, this, this book that we're working through doesn't allow for a very expansive comparative um, understanding of these things. Um, to be honest with you, in my classes at Cal State LA, because I kind of pull the text together, it allows for more of this comparative thought. Because for example, at Cal State LA, we're gonna go into this book next week, right? Um, so I, I think, to answer your question directly, I believe we're working through Karanga's brainchild and, and his interests because he's the, the, the producer of the book. And, and this is no slight on Karanga. He's a very ancient and brilliant scholar, right? But I, I just think he hasn't gone, I don't know, I'm gonna say that. He didn't put the attention on the religions of Mesopotamia. Because I do believe he talks about um, the African presence in Central, in Central, in Central America and Mexico, but he doesn't look at it from a religious standpoint. Does that answer your question, Bob? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Gabriel, I know you were going to say yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah, I was, yeah, um, was going to say that like, I was interested in how um, the concept in African religion were the first ones to, but it was like the first that was made, so it was what influenced all the other religions. Yeah. And, and, and hmm. I think really what you said, Gabriel, right there was a very, um, concise and succinct way to say what I've been saying for the past hour, right? Like I, I didn't get yeah. like these old robust ass um, examples, but yeah, mm -hmm. what you just said right there is essentially what my man, that's my thesis, right? Is just, if we are the first people on the planet, chances are we are the first people to think about religion. Chances are all other religions at some level are adapted or, or stem from ours. Um, okay, it is 1228. Uh, Baba Pierre, are you okay if we call it a day?
Lauren, did you have a question before we close it out? Oh, I had a few, like a list of questions. I just wanted to go over the syllabus with you. I'm sorry. Um, go over the syllabus with me? Yeah, just like a few questions that yeah. I had. If, if it's okay with everyone else, we could, we could do that. And if y'all got to so, go, I'm okay with that too. Yeah, I'm sorry. It was, the first one was this week's journal assignment module is blocked. Uh, the rest of the journals are also blocked for week number six. It says the journal's locked till February 21st. Mm, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll look and so check we, that. And then next one. Are you going to explain the three to five essays in the syllabus? How many essays are there and when are these essays due? And um, then, um, are you, oh, I'm sorry. As far as the essays, um, it's not, it's one essay, right? But it's going to be like, for example, the first part of the essay, the first essay that you'll turn in is going to be your abstract. So what is your idea or what is your question, right? So we're going to build up into a complete essay and you'll turn that final essay in at the end of the semester. So after our midterm, okay. like our secondary project will be like cultivating that essay. So for example, kind of um, let the fourth wall down. In your journal, right, you have a question portion, correct? The re another reason why I'm having you do this portion question is because the, one of those questions should turn into your essay, right? Because a good essay starts from a question. And, and it's really, there's three ways to think about a question. And I'm sorry for being long-winded, but I wanna just provide a thorough answer. Um, so a question, because I've read this, I don't understand what I read, so boom, I have a question, right? Um, the second one is, mm, I read this, but this is making me think about something else. So I'm gonna go do research on whatever it is I'm thinking about, right? So that's the second iteration of a question. Um, the third and more important type of question is, I have this question and my whole paper will be dedicated to answering this question. So for example, my dissertation is on a Pan-African pedagogy, right? So the question that's driving my dissertation is, what is the ideal pedagogy or teaching format for African students as a whole? Right. So now I'm going to just go through the process within my 250 pages of answering that question. So really, I want you all to start asking questions that are the second and third type. Right. Mm, this is making me think about this. So I'm going to go research it. Or this question is going to be I, what I'll be answering in my essay. Right. So that's why that's the reason and the rationale for your questions. And what I will have you do after the midterm is Go back and read through the questions in your journal and think about which one you could turn into a paper. And it's going to be like a staggered process to where by the end of the process, you'll have a complete essay done. Okay, you can go. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then, so you said these essays are going to be due after the midterm, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then, are you said you're going to go over the midterm and the finals as time goes closer. And then... Okay. There's no final, just a midterm. No final. Oh, there's no final. Okay. And then are there any project research uh, reports you just said there was and then tests or quizzes in this class or any other assignments or anything else like that? No, just the uh, midterm is the only test you have. Um, I, I really try not to inundate you guys with a lot of work because I know we're doing a lot of reading and I'd rather just you think about the material and then produce a paper at the end. So there won't be um, any of that outside of um, the normal um, discussion questions that are on, you know what I mean, that, that are on the modules and what have you. Awesome. And just two more questions. I'm sorry. Uh, you said later you will explain the files, like how to upload the journals uh, for the midterm as time gets closer to, right? And yeah. then um, the email that you sent out this morning, uh, it was for week five. You said as long as we did it, then we're good, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't know if you all noticed, but it says week five and then the due date is the 18th. The due date was okay. Left. It should have been the eleventh. Oh, um, you know. Okay. What I mean? So, so really, if you're if you're sticking you. to the week, then you're okay. Don't worry about the date, right? Does, it, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yes, and then just week six, uh, wasn't able to access. That was the right. only thing. I'm, I'll go look at that right now. Um, and, and thank I think you so much. A lot of that is um, to save myself work. I just re-uploaded the um, class from last semester, and it's probably like some things are off. You know, so so. I'll oh, okay. That. Okay. Thank um, you. That was everything. Cool. Thank you. That was a very, um, actually, it was probably helpful for everybody. So thank you for taking the time to do that.
Thank you. Mm -hmm.